All right. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Helen and Tim, for inviting me this evening to talk about uh, what's going on with Jokowi's presidency. And I've been tasked uh, with this theme this evening, this topic, which is a considerably large one in my opinion, but I have 15 minutes, so I'll do my best. Jokowi, his cabinet and the parliament. So for those of you who've been uh, tracking the Jokowi presidency so far, you'll, you'll know that recently surveys um, have uh, shown that uh, Jokowi's presidency is currently um, unpopular, we would say. His approval rating um, in a survey um, taken about a month ago showed him as only having 44% approval and 42% disapproval. And another poll uh, undertaken by Compass um, at the same time, more or less, showed a drop from 80% approval for his first three months uh, of presidency to currently 60%. Commentators have remarked um, that, you know, that they're wondering why this is the case, that uh, his uh, approval ratings have dropped now when it was indeed in the first early stage of his government that he undertook to uh, make the some somewhat painful uh, cuts to fuel subsidies and yet uh, there was no drop in popularity as a consequence of that action. So what uh, has happened in his presidency more recently? Why is he um, uh, facing such unpopularity now? I guess this is a question for the panel as a whole, uh, but my part this evening is just to describe one part of the picture of the first six months of Jokowi's presidency, and that is the trials and tribulations involved in the relationships between the lawmaking institutions of government, that is the president, his cabinet, and the parliament. So just before his inauguration in October last year, in an interview with Compass, Jokowi outlined his expectations for how he would deal with the parliament, which, as we know, he did not have control of a, a majority of, uh, a majority coalition. This was his response. It's just a matter of communication and the public needn't worry that he's done this before and he's still been able to do the job. When asked about his expectations of the cabinet, and uh, which was at that time still not yet announced, he replied uh, with this comment here about target setting and accountability um, of his uh, ministers. Clearly, Jokowi's expectations for these branches of government were considerable, but as were the expectations of the people who had elected him on a platform of uh, pursuing a reform-oriented, clean uh, government that would improve the lot of people's, for people in their daily lives. But as we see from these recent polls, uh, these, uh, we know that these expectations do not seem uh, to have been met yet. I'll argue that from the outset, the composition of these governing institutions, the cabinet and uh, the parliament, and their subsequent management in the last six months, have led to what is so far an ineffective government. And although there are signs that this may turn around, the lessons of the past six months also indicate some hazards for Jokowi going forward. This is just my attempt at some kind of diagram to demonstrate a little, uh, I guess the, the primary branches of lawmaking um, within the government, um, but also to show how they sit within a whole range of uh, uh, interest groups, centres of power. It's a complex constellation of interests. And uh, it's really just a, a basic representation of those to show us how you know, this is a web of uh, networks that are at work. Not just, it's not just about the parliament, the president and the cabinet, far from it. So as I said, this time last year, uh, Jokowi was a hugely popular um, candidate for president. Um, uh, there were signs from him that he would be able to, uh, the hope was that he would be able to take on um, what was you know, a st a, the machinery of government in Indonesia, which was desperately in need of reform. And there was hope that he would be uh, pot potentially the one to do it, having undertaken you know, similar um, tasks in local government um, in Solo and then again in Jakarta. But the fact is that there are few signs that the establishment um, within the administrative structures and institutions of government 
are being at all pressured to shift their positions or to give over an inch of their uh, political powers so far. These enduring elements are contributing, along with some bad decisions and errors in judgment um, on behalf of the president and his staff to scandals and blunders, making headlines in the national newspapers and culminating in editorials in recent weeks, declaring his government in a shambles. So just, just to uh, fill in a little of the blanks here, um, some of you will all, all uh, no doubt un, uh, be aware that the President of Indonesia has constitutional powers to make government regulations, uh, which, which have the same status as law, although the law must then be endorsed or passed by the parliament. Previously in the past, if there was a dispute between the president, this was particularly the case with SBY and the parliament, the parliament uh, in most cases would back off or some concessions would be given and so forth. But at the beginning of uh, Jokowi's presidency, as I'll discuss in a minute, uh, he was confronted with an active opposition that was intent on uh, disrupting his government, disrupting uh, the passage of his uh, laws and policies. So as we know, um, the results of the April 2014 parliamentary election gave no one party uh, a, a um, large enough share um, of the parliamentary uh, seats, of the seats in parliament. The PDIP was indeed um, the largest with 19%, uh, but then it was Golkar and Garindra following. So coalitions uh, in the parliament were also always going to be vital and play a role for this government. And I'll get onto that in just a moment. But first of all, to the cabinet. So when it was finally announced, and Jokowi did deliberate for quite some time and took his time, um, and that was all encouraging for observers because it was understood that he was uh, taking this very seriously and making hopefully good choices. But when he did announce his cabinet, the response was generally one of disappointment um, for those who'd hoped that it would be overwhelmingly reform-minded. Um, instead, it showed signs of compromise and concessions. And again, Jokowi had set expectations, the public's expectations for this cabinet very high. This would be, he told everyone, a clean cabinet. It would get the job done as well. But the critics, as I say, didn't take long to attack and highlight the problems with some appointees who were called out for being inexperienced, for being party hacks, and for having bad track records including some with criminal and corruption allegations against them, despite this um, very careful vetoing that was allegedly uh, had taken place. So as Marcus Meitzner wrote earlier this year, even though Jokowi had insisted uh, that he would resist this kind of formula where deals would be done and preferences would be given um, for particular groups um, to repay their support, uh, this was, of course, um, in the end, not, a, not possible. So there was widespread disappointment that Jokowi had delivered more of the same with his cabinet. The appointment of eight women ministers was singled out um, as a highlight by, by some commentators and quite rightly, because this was the most women uh, so far represented in, an Indonesian, uh, in a cabinet of an Indonesian government. But you wonder if it was just a distraction. Um, and we know that Megawati's daughter and PDIP senior figure, Puan, um, who's widely considered uh, to be uh, far, uh, to not have huge capacity um, as a leader, um, was appointed to a highly strategic coordinating ministry position, um, thereby strengthening her position and keeping herself and her mother close to Jokowi, for example. Oh, just one moment. So, after just six months um, in government, and with the polls showing that the public is concerned with a range of issues, including the economy, corruption, and justice. There have been calls now for a reshuffle of the cabinet. Jokowi told pollsters a few weeks ago, let's just wait and see. But meanwhile, a de the Deputy Secretary General of his political party, Ahmad Basara, was telling journalists that it was inevitable that there would be a reshuffle. And uh, particularly, he says, the cabinet's performance reflects badly on the president's performance. Okay. So why, sorry, why don't the cabinet, why don't the people think that the executive is getting the job done? Well, compromises, as I've said, with appointments mean that clearly the best people were not necessarily or are not necessarily doing the, these jobs. And as Dave McRae has observed, fewer than a third of these appointments had backgrounds appropriate to their ministerial posts. 
So clearly they're learning on the job and they need a little bit more time if they are to do any better. But mostly the government has not yet truly started to govern. They have had to wait for the budget um, before moving to implement programs, particularly uh, to implement Jokowi's big ticket um, infrastructure and food security and education programs. But clearly the people have become impatient. They expected things to move quicker. The budget is now in train and so we will start to see pro these big projects roll out um, and this situation may alter. Um, and as Jokowi says, we'll have to wait and see. But I've also heard that there will be a reshuffle and it will just occur after Lebaran to enable the ministers to enjoy the benefits of being a minister whilst uh, during Lebaran. Well, clearly um, for the DPR and Jokowi, the trouble began very early. And as I mentioned, uh, Jokowi inherited a highly hostile parliament in which the coalition of parties that he led was a minority coalition. At the time of the new parliament being installed in late October, the balance was uh, the red and white coalition led by Prabowo's Gurindra with about a little over 60% and the Great Indonesia Coalition including PDIP with just under 40%. The scene for the parliament was set as we know in September 2014 when in the last days of the old parliament's tenure, the Prabowo-led coalition of parties proposed the termination of direct elections of local government and gov local government leaders and the return to pre-2005 indirect voting by local legislatures. This bill was passed by the Red and White Coalition, as we know, until SBY, still president, intervened and replaced it by presidential ruling. All, every, this may have been an inevitability, perhaps, in, uh, when seen from the position of the Red and White Coalition, uh, who can tell? But everyone acknowledged that this was indeed intended as a shot across Jokowi's bows by the Red and White Coalition, and in particular, uh, Prabol's uh, Gurindra. Then this was followed by a further win for the Red and White Coalition in October when the new government, um, and with the new government and the commencement of the new parliament, and the Red and White Coalition swept the pool, winning the positions of Speaker and Deputy Speakers and heads of all House committees in the Parliament, which was not normally the case, that it was traditionally the case that the, um, the government would take the position of Speaker of the House. In response, the Great Indonesia Coalition was outraged and in protest, it set up an opposition Parliament, effectively boycotting Parliament and rendering it unable to function. At this time, so we're in November last year, Jokowi repeatedly, reportedly told foreign investors and government officials that it was just normal political dynamics happening there. But meanwhile, as he opted to simply stand back and let this play out, significant red flags were going up all over the place and the government was potentially heading towards an even messier situation. Further in the midst of this, it was revealed that Jokowi had written a secret letter to heads of government agencies and to the ministers with the instruction not to attend if called by the parliament. Jokowi had described in this letter, he described the parliament as a mess and he asked that the ministers and others just wait until it sorted itself out. The letter of course was inevitably leaked and the response from the parliament was predictable. And it was clear that Jokowi had made a rookie error, perhaps, in his interpretation of his obligations according to the Constitution, and his rivals took great pleasure in calling him out on it. Uh, under the Constitution, the President and the Ministers cannot refuse to attend uh, the Parliament when called. So his strategy of no communication was clearly a wrong turn and seemed um, strange given his responses to the uh, the interview with Kompas um, at the, on the eve of his inauguration when, he's, when he replied that it would all be about communication with the parliament in, or, in order to overcome uh, these differences. Meanwhile, in a somewhat smarter move, um, given the hostile state of affairs um, between the parliament, uh, or within the parliament and, and between the presidency, um, and learning from the lessons of the regional election bill, Jokowi and his ministers set about implementing his election promises to wipe out the fuel sub subsidy and introduce health and education welfare measures, this time using his constitutional powers to do so by presidential regulation. But 
This was fine, but he again failed to make any friends in the DPR as a consequence of that. But the, red, the secret letter revelation, I would say, was like a red rag to a bull, particularly for Gorindra's henchman, uh, Fadli Zon, pictured there. And uh, he, amongst others, gave out, um, were able to give out threats that they would impede the government's business further, and they began to engage in all sorts of mischief-making, I would call it. So in response to all of this, Jokowi is forced to finally act to intervene okay, in the stalemate between the two sides, calling a meeting with Prabowo, which in turn led to a meeting with the coalition ministers at which they signed a peace pact or rapprochement of some kind with a number of heads of committee positions given across to the Great Indonesia Coalition, and that was signed in, in uh, November. But who controls the parliament? This is the question, because even from the very beginning of uh, parliament, um, the coalitions were already in flux. Leadership disputes were at play, particularly in the United, um, sorry, in the United Development Party, and also particularly in Golkar, which has played out um, across these mo many months. And so in both parties, you see um, splits with rival leaderships and rival factions, and each of them siding um, different numbers siding with the different uh, coalitions. Um, you've also got cases of parties swapping sides, like PAN, who was, that was one of the founding members of the uh, Red and White Coalition, um, has expressed its desire to exit, or more or less to vote for its members to be able to vote based on the particular issue, not to feel compelled to follow the coalition line. And there's all sorts of other things um, happening, and it feels like it's back to normal. <laughs> so whilst, if you count all the numbers, it still might look like the red and white coalition have a majority, this image that we had at the beginning of uh, the parliamentary session of um, a strong and united opposition looks shot through, and there's clearly signs that um, these coalitions will not ho hold. All in all, on the surface, this is probably not a bad situation for Jokowi after facing the prospect of an entirely hostile parliament. But I would say that even though they're working towards, uh, working towards a working relationship, um, this has not all been smooth sailing, and you'd ask at what cost to the Jokowi presidency uh, some of these uh, exchanges and concessions. So business was going along quite well and things were getting done between uh, the ministries and the president and uh, the parliament and then we come across this, uh, the, the uh, scandal involving the nomination of Budi Gunawan as police chief and Dave's going to talk about that so I won't go into much detail except to say that it opened another rift between the president, the ministries and the parliament at the time Jokowi was obviously very uh, reluctant to completely dismiss or to refuse the election of Budu Gunawan, who was a uh, close of his friend and aide of his, uh, his leader, Megawati. And in order to avoid this, he, he sent the nomination, just the sole nomination to the parliament for them to ratify, um, hoping maybe that they would reject it, but they did not. They're a little bit smarter than that. They've been around the block a few times. And they, uh, as one Golka um, member said, uh, they just simply returned that hot potato to the one who threw it first. And the president had to um, make the call in the end. So there was a messy fallout from that. Um, there were divisions, particularly amongst the PDIP members. And, um, but it also in made the opposition, again, a little bit um, able to uh, strengthen its hand a little bit um, in this case. Then it came very shortly after the car allowance scandal, which um, involved, uh, again, uh, this information coming to light that uh, the minister, that the, um, uh, basically a handout, a sweetener had been offered to members um, of parliament and uh, to other officials clearly in order to smooth the way for some of the government business um, that was pending, particularly perhaps um, the Budi Gunawan uh, situation and the nomination of his replacement. So all of these deals being done in the background um, and possibly you know, we're seeing uh, compromises being made by Jokowi himself personally about how he would prefer to be doing um, running his government. Um, you see him extending a hand to Prabowo and Prabowo extending a hand to him, forming this um, 
kind of very uncomfortable alliance of sorts uh, between the two of you, uh, between the two of them. Just really quickly, just to show this last slide, which is just to say that even though uh, th there have been these ructions and difficulties, um, some good things have come out so far um, from the, in the working relationship. The regional law that Jokowi's coalition fought against was in fact passed very quietly without uh, great um, brouhaha. The amended state budget so important for this government in order to achieve um, what it wants to deliver also passed uh, by the parliament. And as I said, confirmation of the replacement of Budi Gonawan's uh, replacement as police chief. So there have been actually good workings between uh, the two of the, uh, between the two branches. But I would say that um, even though this, this, this parliament that we um, face today um, does not have the coalitions that are strong and um, oppositional as they were in the beginning, and so potentially Jokowi has a little bit more uh, room to move. Um, but on the other hand, Jokowi and the cabinet have much more to lose in terms of public opinion. So in the last few months, we've seen the parliament uh, in headlines announcing that Jokowi is as bad as the parliament. And what that is code for, we understand, is that it means corrupt, it means dirty. Um, so the hope is that the government can start to govern and roll out its major policies as the budget um, comes into train. But the key concern for Jokowi is that he must tread carefully between uh, his uh, alliances with Megawati and, their, and also with Prabowo. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Helen, for, for a very uh, thorough introduction. And thanks, Gemma, for, for a wonderful start to the evening. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming along. Um, I want to begin my talk tonight uh, with a moment that stuck in my memory from last year's Indonesian presidential campaign. It was right at the end, in the last candidate debate. Towards the end of that debate, after I thought another lacklustre performance from Jokowi and his running mate Yusuf Kala, when finally uh, Yusuf Kala questioned Prabowo on his rhetoric about uh, nefarious politicians stealing Indonesia's wealth. Uh, Yusuf Kala said, perhaps a tad optimistically, none of these thieves are in our coalition, so where could they be? Uh, and then went on to make very unsubtle references to the various corruption cases either concluded in progress or foreshadowed against members of Prabowo's coalition. And so what you saw there, I thought, was Yusuf Kala really hammering home a point of difference that in a campaign where both sides had claimed that they would improve the fight against corruption, that based on who was in the coalitions and their track record, that he and Jokowi were simply the more credible choice. But I think over the, the next six months, the first six months of Jokowi's presidency, uh, contrary to the hopes that that rhetoric has generated, you've instead seen Jokowi's largest mis misstep to date uh, coming in his anti-corruption efforts, uh, namely when he nominated a tainted candidate for national police chief because of that uh, candidate's closeness to Megawati and PDIP, as Gemma mentioned, uh, thereby undermining Indonesia's most important anti-corruption agency, the uh, Anti-Corruption Commission, the KPK, as I'll explain in, the second, in a second, further estranging his party and his most vocal backers by the way he handled the instant public controversy that this generated, and raising longer term questions over whether Jokowi is able to control the police, uh, an institution that is directly under the president in Indonesia. So tonight I'd like to discuss why it was that Jokowi might have made that choice and what the longer term implications will be, uh, for both for Indonesia's anti-corruption fight and also for his government more broadly. But before doing that, uh, I think we need a little bit of background just to go through some of the twists and turns. And the first thing to emphasise is this is not the first time that the police and the KPK have come into conflict. Uh, it's the third time in six years. Uh, I've put up briefly here a timeline. I think the commonalities you can see across the cases are each are triggered when the Anti-Corruption Commission goes after a very senior member of the police. In each case, you see the police then launch uh, counter prosecutions against the KPK, uh, relying on a part of the KPK law that provides that if any of its commissioners become suspects in a criminal case, they must be suspended even before they're charged. And I don't have time to go through the details. I think more common features are that each time we've seen belated support from the president in the first two cases, President Udiono 
but almost instant and enthusiastic public, public support for the KPK because it's a new institution, one that has extraordinary powers to go after corruption and one that's formed specifically to take on corruption cases that the police and the attorney generals have failed to, hold, uh, failed to handle. It's been along with the constitutional court until it ran into some trouble, uh, far and away the most trusted political institution uh, in Indonesia. And just one point I'll highlight, these conflicts between the KPK and the police are typically referred to within Indonesia as the gecko taking on the crocodile. And that dates from a rather unfortunate comment made in a media interview by Susno Duaji, uh, the first target of the KPK in these investigations when asked about it at the time, saying, if you were to compare, here is a crocodile, meaning the police, there is a gecko, the KPK. Why is the gecko taking on a crocodile? Uh, does it make the crocodile angry? No, we just regret it. Uh, the chitchuk still doesn't know any better. Uh, we've tried to teach it, but after so many years, why is it still not clever? Uh, and uh, sort of, uh, I, I can't imagine how he felt that would go over with the public, uh, but <laughs> perhaps not quite as he expected. So the evolution of this year's crisis is quite complicated, and to follow this rather congested timeline, imagine a, how does it appear up there, a snake coiled around that central arrow with its tail at the bottom left and kind of spiralling all the way over. Uh, and anyway, the, the, the controversy bubbled to public attention in January when Jokowi nominated Budi Gunawan as National Police Chief, but really it dates back at least to October, uh, when as uh, Gemma mentioned, Jokowi used the KPK and the Financial Tracking Agency in Indonesia to veto some of the most egregious nominations that his political backers had made for the cabinet. Uh, Budi Gunawan was one to receive a red mark at the time, meaning uh, that he faced uh, imminent uh, investigation or possible suspect status for corruption. And it was a widely praised move, uh, some saw it as sort of agile by a president who lacked a strong political base, but its downside was that it really politicised the KPK. Uh, it, uh, the KPK already had been politicised by the ambitions of its head at the time, Abraham Samad, to run for vice president back in July and I think this, this further added to it. But anyway, uh, to, to run very quickly through some of these steps, as, as Gemma mentioned, although the KPK almost instantly made Budigunowan a corruption suspect, because if they hadn't, uh, he would have been untouchable virtually as police chief, uh, Jokowi left it to the DPR, you imagine, to knock him out. Uh, for a DPR that was hostile to the KPK because it so often prosecutes its members, uh, was hostile to Jokowi, this was a golden opportunity uh, to weaken both at once. So they simply returned it to him, but with the degree of public controversy uh, and you would hope uh, sort of an aversion to appointing uh, uh Jokowi deferred the appointment and made Badrodin Haiti, another policeman who'd been mentioned in media reportage as possibly tainted by the same uh, fat accounts, uh, un unaccounted for wealth as Burigunawan the acting police chief. Now, straight after this, uh, the revenge prosecutions uh, against the KPK that we saw in the previous cases began, uh, aided by the fact that Budi Gunawan's, uh, a key right-hand man, was made the head of the criminal investigative division of the police. And so we saw the head of the KPK made a suspect uh, for falsifying identity documents uh, years before in South Sulawesi. Uh, another commissioner of the KPK made a suspect uh, for compelling uh, a witness to give false testimony, uh, a case revived against an investigator from 2004 uh, for the death of a suspect in custody. So you had these apparent trumped up charges that Jokowi was unwilling to stop, and so he needed to uh, suspend those commissioners. And the new commissioners that he appointed uh, not only didn't challenge uh, Budi Gunawan's success in having his suspect status revoked, uh, but dropped the Budi Gunawan case and returned it to the Attorney General's office, essentially burying it. So this rolled on for around a month uh, until and Jokowi appointed a, eminent, uh, a panel of eminent persons to consider the case. And so he had to suffer constant negative press coverage depicting him as indecisive, uh, a, a vulnerability for Jokowi, given that he almost lost out in the election to a aspiring strongman in Prabowo. But what we saw was uh, five days after he got his budget through, 
the DPR, uh, Budigunawan, was promptly dropped uh, as police chief. And uh, Badrodin Haiti was submitted to the, parla uh, to the parliament uh, because a police chief has to go through the parliament before they can be appointed. This rolled on, the, the parliament dragged its feet, but as it was coming to the end of its, uh, its timeline to confirm Jokowi's nomination, it did in fact uh, appoint Badrodin Haiti as the permanent police chief. When it did that, there were rumors that Budigunawan would resurface as deputy police chief, and that's indeed what we've seen happen. And since he's gained that role, we've seen a re-intensification of those uh, revenge prosecutions against the KPK uh, with moves to take various of the, of the people into custody. So I guess if we were to do a roundup of where this leaves things uh, after, you know, what are we looking at now, four months of crisis, you have uh, no ongoing investigations into the police by the KPK. Uh, Budi Gunawan and his key backer in two of the three most senior posts within the police, uh, even if the top job has for the moment eluded Budi Gunawan, uh, whereas the KPK has lost two of its commissioners, uh, dropped, I think, the first case uh, that it's dropped in its operation, and itself faces a, a host of ongoing prosecutions. So a, a significant reverse for the KPK. And the question this raises is why Jokowi would turn to Budi Gunawan uh, just a couple of months uh, after the KPK had vetoed him uh, as a ministerial appointment. And the answer lies in, as Gemma pointed out, his dysfunctional relationship with his party. Where Jokowi never enjoyed the full support of PDIP, uh, he's the first Democratic era president, in fact, not to have the unequivocal support of his party. And it was clear that PDIP, long before the 2014 elections, uh, saw themselves as the governing party in waiting uh, with all manner of ideas about who they would appoint, what their agenda would be, and a determination to be more ready for government than what they had been uh, when Megawati became president through Abdurrahman Wahid's impeachment. And the party maintained this mindset uh, even after it failed to gain enough votes in the legislative election uh, really to justify it, uh, meaning that it would have to enter into a governing coalition and rely on the president to win many more votes than it as a party had been able to. Uh, it saw PDIP insist on, or sorry, it saw senior PDIP figures in key positions in Jokowi's transitional team to prepare his agenda after he was elected. Uh, it saw Megawati uh, veto at least one of Jokowi's cabinet appointments uh, from her own party and also seek to influence uh, more broadly the cabinet selection. And it saw PDIP and Megawati grow angry uh, when Jokowi chose a chief of staff uh, from outside the party uh, to obviously a very uh, key position within the presidency. Uh, so one uh, interpretation that was uh, suggested to me by someone familiar with the nomination process, uh, we've seen predominantly the press report that Budi Gunawan was forced upon Megawati, but I've also seen uh, this person suggested to me that in fact it may have been Jokowi's idea to placate uh, Megawati and seek to address this dysfunctional relationship. That's something Tempo magazine has also reported, but I'm not in a position to know uh, which it was, whether Mega took the initiative or Jokowi. But anyway, the, uh, the, full, uh, the full extent of the dysfunction uh, became clear uh, as, the, uh, as the affair dragged on. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, Jokowi waited until after the budget was passed to drop uh, the nomination and you saw PDIP uh, campaign actively to discredit Abraham Samad. Uh, this culminated in uh, mega giving Jokowi a dressing down at the party conference. Uh, and uh, what do you call it? Uh, we, we remain to be seen. You, you do wonder why was Jokowi willing to, to do this? Uh, and you know, if, if the version is right that it was his initiative and he used the appointment to placate Mega, then you wonder whether he doesn't see law enforcement as particularly important and it's an area where he feels he can afford to make political compromises. And here you see the Attorney General wearing his uh, Nustem party jacket. Uh, he's a politician appointed as Attorney General and obviously Woody uh, uh, Perhaps uh, if the version of Mega taking the the uh, initiative uh, is correct to me. There's a more and less pessimistic scenario. The more pessimistic one is that, again, he, he just doesn't see law enforcement important, willing to accept priorities. Uh, he got the budget through. 
uh, meaning he had more funds to spend uh, on things like his signature health program, the Kata Indonesia Sehat. The slightly less pessimistic version uh, is that uh, he may see governance as something that he'd like to improve, but he simply doesn't have the support base to do it uh, with his dysfunctional relationship with Mega, and as uh, Gemma mentioned, needing to reach out to Prabowo uh, because he simply hasn't uh, fought across the six months of his presidency to get his political supporters uh, into key positions in the government. So what are the longer term implications out of this? Uh, well, for the fight against corruption, I think the uh, last six months has been some of the most damaging to the anti-corruption efforts in Indonesia. You've got the KPK badly weakened with a clear template for anyone wanting to take them on and the police uh, willing to pursue spurious prosecu prosecutions, it would seem, uh, to enable people to confront the KPK. Uh, senior police now look essentially above the law, at least for the moment, and you have tainted officers uh, in senior positions and some question over whether they'll obey presidential uh, instructions, which I'll cover in a sec. Uh, you have a very poorly regarded Attorney General. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of his performance on corruption, but certainly uh, he's shown scant regard for the rule of law in death penalty cases. And in this weakened position that KPK is in, in the last day, we've seen reports that they're now willing to enter into a joint police uh, Attorney General KPK task force for complicated corruption cases which flies in the face of the fact that the KPK was formed uh, because of the weaknesses of the police and the attorney generals in uh, prosecuting cases. So is all hope lost? Uh, well, certainly it's not an easy path back from here. Uh, the KPK will need new commissioners by the end of the year. And the key points here are to see uh, these commissioners are appointed by a selection committee the president then submits double the number of people to the DPR who choose five. So we'll see which ministries dominate that selection protest, anti-corruption activists have called for the uh, for Pratikno, the Ugeim Rector, to be dominant in that and who is appointed to it. Uh, the uh, other thing, of course, will be whether Jokowi is able to establish more control of the police. Uh, and the really worrying thing here with uh, Budi Gunawan and his right-hand man, Budi Waseso, in these senior positions is we've had Budi Waseso in the last couple of, well, yesterday, I think, uh, flagging that uh, Jokowi may be called as a witness for a corruption case in Jakarta. Uh, this kind of pinces the president because if he had previously thought of dismissing these senior people because they haven't been following his orders promptly, now it could be spun that he was seeking to close down a possible investigation into, into corruption. So, uh, you'd have to say, well played uh, on, on that front to, to those senior police officers. Um, the, I guess the point of hope is public pressure. Uh, it, it remains obviously behind uh, the KPK and we've seen in every police KPK confrontation that public pressure has been able to change the behavior of elite actors. And this public pressure in support of the KPK uh, I think links into the question of implications for Jokowi's government more broadly. Because as I've mentioned, what he's done with the way he's handled this affair is alienated perhaps the most vocal part of his base. The, the civil society uh, and uh, media people who were some of those to mobilize as volunteers. Uh, I don't know that alienating that base uh, decisively ends his electoral prospects. What we don't really understand is what motivates the mass of voters. Uh, Gemma mentioned Jokowi's approval rating has gone down, but to be honest, it hasn't gone as low as, as what you would expect uh, with, with some of the crises his government has faced. And when you look at what surveys say, uh, they consistently rank the economy as most important to voters, then jobs, and only corruption third. So I think if Jokowi were able to keep funding his signature health and education programs, much harder to do with poor governance, obviously, uh, were able to construct enough infrastructure to keep the economy going, it remains an open question as to whether it'll be the corruption fight uh, where the 2019 election is decisively won and lost. Thank you. And Tim for the invitations and also Helen for the long introductions. Um, <clears throat> so the, the elements of civil society supported uh, Jokowi in 2014 presidential elections due to a number of factors. Mainly he was seen as an honest and hum humble leader in Solo and also in Jakarta. 
his down to earth style of leadership was considered unusual in Indonesian politics. There seems no gap between him and the people he led. Joko Widodo also had a good record in getting things done. Since the beginning, the elements of civil society, uh, students, NGOs, activists, press, and even musicians knew it very well that Joko's strength is that people like him, not because his political party wanted him. He did not get a full support from his own party. The results of legislative election ra last year revealed that people did not want PDIP gain a majority seat to control the DPR, the parliament, despite the fact that the PDIP had announced Jokowi candidacy before the legislative elections took place. PDIP only got 15 additional seats compared with the seats they had in 2009 elections. Civil society did not trust political party, they had more trust on Jokowi. During the campaign, Jokowi also made it clear that he did not want political party supported him only to get ministerial positions. Yes, we can have a good laugh now. Right? Um, Jokowi won the election and quickly labeled as the people's president. The widespread support from society was mobilized by volunteers or relawan. Uh, relawan also persuaded those who did not usually vote, uh, golput, golongan putih, uh, to uh, attend uh, the poll. Their movement was not directly connected with the party supporting Jokowi and uh, JK, Yusuf Kala. Take example of the concert organized before the presidential election. Hundreds of artists, musicians, and creative workers team up to hold a concert in support of Jokowi and JK. The concert entitled Salam Dua Jari, Two Finger Salute Concert, Road to Victory was organized by the non-profit group Revolusi Harmony and was initiated by Abdi, a member of the country's biggest rock band, Slang. Jokowi is us, became, became the main campaign slogan. Jokowi and JK admitted later on, after the elections, that the concert was a crucial moment, as at the time, polling showed that the gap between Jokowi and Prabowo was less than 1%. Now the questions I pose for my presentation this evening, are the elements of civil society still supportive? Is the honeymoon over? If yes, now what? Before I start answering the main questions, a little explanation of the volunteers behind Jokowi's campaign will be helpful. I refer to Amalinda Safirani's article that explains there are at least three elements in the volunteers' groups. First is the former activist involved in the 1990s pro-democracy movement to topple Suharto. The second group are activists from various NGOs ranging from the anti-corruption movement uh, to indigenous community groups. The third are artists and people in the creative sector. The third group is relatively less experienced in politics than the first two groups. Uh, the former 1990s pro-democracy activists and NGOs, the first and the second group, have specific political agenda. They want to free Indonesia from possible military domination and want the state to observe human rights principles. With their long experience in the democracy movement, they are generally, they generally the main organizer of volunteers. They include as many social groups as possible to create a bigger movement. However, the first and second groups have no real support from the masses. They get uh, invited to talk on, on TV, but they know that uh, their lack of support from, uh, uh, from uh, society. Uh, Despite their lack of political experience, the third group is the magnet of the relawan movement. Their popularity as artists on social media succeeded in drawing more supporters and followers. So uh, Dave uh, has, I think, uh, only one million supporters, followers in, in Twitter. Uh, but Gita Gutawa has 4.4 million <laughs> followers in her Twitter. Uh, once she retweet to support Jokowi, in a second, 4.4 million followers read it in their smartphone, wherever they are. Uh, it was this group that attracted Indonesian citizens from all walks of life to support Jokowi. They used music, posted memes on social media, created a series of cartoons on Jokowi, and made t-shirts and all kinds of campaign merchandise. But unlike the first and second group, the artists had no specific political agenda. They wanted Indonesia to be better with no concrete imagination of what it is like to be a better Indonesia. Now let us discuss what's wrong with Jokowi. 
in the first six months of the, his presidency from civil society movement perspective. We have heard so many problems faced by Jokowi that undermine his legacy as the people's president from previous speakers, so I will not repeat it again. But I think it is important to highlight that in the first six months, Jokowi doesn't know who the enemies are and who are his loyal supporters in the government. Everything is blurred. Politically speaking, he practically the weakest president in the Indonesian history so far. His position is much worse than Gus Dur's presidency. Uh, since I'm Roy Surya of Nahdlatul Ulama in Australia, I think members of NU uh, will not get angry with me when I compare Jokowi and Gus Dur. So, I, so I'll be fine. Uh, Gus Dur controlled PKB, his political party at the time. Although uh, later on uh, he was being kicked out by Muhammad Iskandar. Uh, but uh, he controlled his uh, political party uh, when he became a president. Uh, Jokowi is not in control of his own political party, uh, PDIP, let alone his ruling coalition. He also has to work in a parliament controlled by the opposing coalition, as Jema already mentioned. Jokowi is only petugas partai, who was not allowed to deliver his speech at the PDIP National Congress several weeks ago. Gus Dur, we know that he could not read due to problem with his eyes. But Jokowi admitted he did not read the presidential decree before signing it. I don't read what I sign, that's what uh, he said. Uh, this sends the wrong impressions that he would sign whatever his ministers ask him to sign. The regulation in question would have entitled state officials, uh, many of whom are already provided with work cars, to uh, 211 million rupiah down payment uh, on a car. Gus Dur could talk whatever he wanted without having speechwriter, whereas Jokowi depended on speechwriter and he will read whatever his speechwriter writes. Uh, take an example of what happened during the ASEAN African conference. Knowing that Jokowi would not have that great vision, people immediately wonder who was behind his speech during the opening ceremony of the ASEAN African conference. Uh, people are wondering why uh, he delivered such a good speech. And the Secretary Cabinet proudly revealed to the press about the team behind Jokowi's speech. Perhaps they wanted to get some credit, but actually they just saw how dumb the president was. Not sure whether Jokowi would be forced to resign before his term ended, just like what happened with Gustur. We shall wait and see. And this exactly what elements of civil society was worried if Jokowi was forced to step down. The Vice President Yusuf Kala would replace, would replace Jokowi according to the constitution, and possibly Puan Maharani would be the new vice president. I personally asked many Jokowi supporters such as Imam Prasojo, Hikmahanto Juana, Rai Rangkuti, and others, they are critical of what Jokowi has failed to achieve in the first six months of his presidency, but they are not prepared to see Jokowi would step down, as the alternative for the leadership do not look good. Students' demonstrations are also limited in the numbers uh, at this time, they are still reluctant to ask, to ask Jokowi to be removed. They are also aware, mainly the criticisms of Jokowi's performance come from Jokowi's political party. That, that's a bit strange, right? Uh, Proboy's camp was currently busy dealing with the chaos of Golkar and PPP division. There was rumor that I heard even Jokowi said it to his uh, 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 friends, that Yusuf Kala is preparing himself to replace Jokowi. If this, if this was true, that would explain why Yusuf Kala did not help Jokowi to perform well. Jokowi promises uh, to move together, to work, work, and work, kerja, kerja, and kerja. But in the last six months, he was a busy dealer, trying to accommodate different interests among his coalition party. He has not demonstrated his capacity as a leader of the nations. Uh, he even did not have much time to conduct the blusukan, or walkabouts in slums and markets, his famous habit. Support from the civil society, although the relawan have no longer high expectation on him right now. Maybe they, uh, they realize now he's, he's not a superman. He's no longer a media darling, as the big media such as Compass and Tempo and even Jakarta Post are critical of his program. A survey released by the Jakarta Baseball Tracking Institute uh, has, sound out, has sound that public approval of the Joko administration has plunged below 50%, as Gemma also mentioned. 
and Jokowi was fully aware of his declining popularity. Uh, he, and then he even invited political observer and commentator to his office to talk about his declining uh, support. But to be fair with Jokowi, the declining popularity in the post-election happened to other leaders around the world. There's plenty of precedent for such a decline. I do not need to refer to our Prime Minister Tony Abbott's declining popularity, right? <laughs> but the last three US presidents, including Obama, have all seen their approval rating declining in the first six months after the elections. So perhaps we have to wait and give Jokowi a chance to meet the people's expectation. In the meantime, Jokowi has given some of his volunteer team the position of commissioners in various state enterprises. Perhaps this is to ensure that the volunteers would continue to support him. However, however uh, such move raises the eyebrows, particularly about the selection process. Some positions are not related to the expertise of the relawan. For instance, Refli Harun, a constitutional lawyer, has been appointed as chief commissioner of Jasa Marga Highway Corporation. Jasa Marga president director Aditya Warman defended the decision saying that the company would need Refli's expertise in law to help solve legal issues, especially those related to land acquisitions. That's wrong answer, as the commissioner would not do that. Others get position as commissioners in uh, three uh, 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 big banks in Indonesia, Bank Mandiri, Bank Negara Indonesia, BNI, and Bank Right Indonesia, uh, BRI, whereas they did not seem to have any experience or background in banking. So not only problems appointing a member of cabinet, but also giving position to the volunteers, Jokowi also has some problems here. Uh, other elements of civil society are now facing uh, criminalisasi due to their support to KPK. The case of uh, one of Mafia Melbourne, Professor Denny Indrayana, is illustrative. Denny uh, did his PhD here under Tim Lindsay's supervision. Uh, uh, Denny is known as anti-corruption activist before being appointed as the deputy minister of justice under SBY government. But now he was charged with corruptions, despite police being unable to provide any real evidence of a crime. According to Simon Butt and Tim Lindsay's article, many nervous civil society leaders are choosing to be silent now because of uh, uh, the fear of criminalization here. Uh, perhaps they are afraid that Komjen Buas, Budiwaseso, could, criminal, could criminalize them on small issues such as not wearing helmet or having a two different national ID cards. Now, elements of uh, civil society turn to social media to express their disappointment with Jokowi's uh, government. So, uh, so uh, here for instance, uh, on the left, uh, some people are now cynical uh, about Jokowi's ambitious plan of developing what he calls Sea Toll Road to link the eastern provinces to the country's more developed western regions. They have become doubtful about Jokowi's administration's capability to materialize the infrastructure plan. Their doubt is shown through a meme which depicts a toll road gate in Pluit in West Jakarta, which is surrounded by a flood. It reads, thank God uh, the Sea Toll has been built. Thank you, Jokowi. Uh, another meme shows Jokowi's face here on the right uh, with a white background and a line that reads Kamana President Kita. When the first letter of each of three words is put together, they read uh, KPK. Uh, here on the left, you could see meme shows uh, this is Budi, uh, this is Ibu Budi, and for Jokowi, Berhutang Budi. I don't know how to translate it. <laughs> And another meme here in the social media illustrates people's suspicions that as president of the nation, Jokowi is submissive to the Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle, PDIP, notably its chairwoman Megawati. As such, the cynical says the first president, Sukarno, was a womanizer. The second president was faithful to a woman. The third president had no daughter. The fourth president could not see woman. And the fifth president was a woman. The sixth president respected woman, and the seventh president say it is up to Mama Puan. Yeah. <laughs> so refer to Megawati Sukarno Putri. And the last uh, 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 memes here is this one. So Time magazines uh, last year uh, has a cover with a close-up face, a new hope. And now uh, a civil society through social media put this one like a new hopeless. So. Uh, 
Perhaps Jokowi could learn from Ahok, his uh, former deputy governor, who did not care about his own political party and subsequently withdrew from Gerindra. Ahok shows a courage to confront the corrupt politician. He is aware that no single political party support him, but people support him. That's what really matters for him. So perhaps Jokowi should, be, uh, should learn from Ahok. People are waiting that the real Jokowi will stand up, stop being a dealer, it is time to become a leader. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming and joining us here tonight. Australia and Indonesia will always have tensions in their relationship. All neighbouring countries do, to some extent, for many reasons. In fact, tensions between neighbouring countries mark the history of most countries. Think of the US and Mexico, think of any, almost anywhere you want in Europe. These issues, however, have particular weight in the case of Australia and Indonesia, simply because there are few neighbours with such marked and distinct differences, whether we're talking of differences of race, ethnicity, <coughs> sorry, language, majority religion, economy, geography, demography, and I could even add also the legal system, a European civil law system as against a British common law system. There are very few areas in which there are in fact clear similarities, making the two countries perhaps, as some have said before, the international odd couple. It's therefore not surprising that we have tensions and crises in the bilateral relationship with Indonesia fairly regularly. In fact, it would be very surprising, really, if it was otherwise. The test of the bilateral relationship between Australia and Indonesia is therefore not whether these problems occur, but how they are handled. From an Australian perspective, the tensions are often difficult to manage because they are prone to rapid escalation. This is despite the fact that there is among our politicians now, and has been for some time, bipartisan agreement that the relationship with Indonesia is a vital one. Unlike many other neighbouring countries, and like many other countries in fact, including Indonesia, we have only one large and powerful near neighbour that is rising economically. This rapid escalation of tensions usually occurs because the Australian public is generally very ill-informed about Indonesia and also quite hostile in its attitudes towards Indonesia. And this is the case and has been the case for a long period of time, notwithstanding the many visits, of course, that Australians make to Indonesia. If you look at Bali, for example, it's still the case that around 25% of all visitors to Bali are Australian, with visits to, up, visits to Bali actually increasing by 16.74% in January and February this year uh, compared to the previous year, despite the Bali Nine tensions. The total number of visitors in those two months of over 156,000 people. So the sort of the visits and the engagement between the two countries almost seems to act in a vacuum from attitudes. Attitudes towards Indonesia have, in fact, deteriorated markedly since democratisation and liberalisation in 1998, or since it, they began in 1998. And the polls are absolutely consistent on this. Polls right across the period from 1998, in fact, from the late, the early 90s onwards, and polls taken by a whole range of different polling agencies and groups, government and non-government, all are consistent in showing Australian attitudes towards Indonesia significantly deteriorating and following a clear path downwards in terms of attitude. Part of this, of course, is the perfect storm of bad news events that's dominated representations of Indonesia in Australia, uh, particularly since 1998. Just think of the Bali bombers, the avian flu, SARS, the tsunami, earthquakes, various other floods, people smugglers, the beef cattle crisis, drugs offenders, and so on. The list continues. That plays a part in it. But also the um, probably terminal decline of Indonesian studies in our schools and ultimately our universities also contributes to that process. The two are linked in a sort of downward terminal spiral. This gap between the clear bilateral commitment, sorry, the clear bipartisan commitment of our politicians to the Indonesia relationship, the government-to-government -government enthusiasm of the past, at least prior to Jokowi, and 
increasing public ignorance and hostility creates an inherent fragility in the relationship. Because there is little public support for good relations with Indonesia, politicians often respond to tensions in a fashion contrary to their own better judgment. They might want to support the relationship, but the domestic political situation makes it not feasible. And that means that you usually get a build up in the relationship and a sort of snapping moment and then politicians intervene. And what then quite often follows is a tit for tat retaliatory response from Indonesia. And it ratchets up. All this means that the relationship in Australia at least becomes exp expendable because it's vulnerable to crisis despite the obvious importance of Indonesia to, the relation to Australia and the commitment politically to that, which is a real one amongst federal politicians. Much of this is true also for Indonesian attitudes towards Australia. The, pro the same sort of problems are reflected in Indonesian perceptions of Australia, although to not the same degree of hostility. Indonesians are equally ill-informed about Australia, but they are generally much less hostile and negative in their attitudes to Australia, according again to polling from private and public sectors. Indonesians, for example, welcome Australian investment, although they do believe that Australia wants to control eastern Indonesia. And of course, that makes Papua a particular flashpoint for crisis in the bilateral relationship. Another problem is the lingering influence of the Suharto era on how we vi view bilateral tensions between Australia and Indonesia. Under an authoritarian leader, the bilateral relationship was both much easier and much harder. It was easier because when Suharto was happy, it was all smooth, but it was highly sensitive to his attitude and feelings. The politics of post-Suharto Indonesia, which is a very different place, of course, involve a much more diverse group of interest groups now not just the palace. The linkages between the two countries have also become far more various and complex, particularly at the civil society level. This creates a wider foundation for the relationship and gives it much more resilience than was the case under the new order, but it also creates a whole range of new sources of potential difficulty and tensions in the relationship. And although Suharto is gone, and although the presidency is now constitutionally and politically far, far weaker, as our other speakers have just demonstrated in the case of Jokowi, I don't think it's understood that a lot of Jokowi's political problems link back, as indeed was true for uh, SBE, link back to the fact that the presidency was stripped of most of its powers after the Suharto, the fall of Suharto in the period leading up to, from 1999 to 2002. It is a weaker institution. But despite all of that, we still focus heavily on the presidency as the essential barometer of the bilateral relationship with Australia. Now, this was certainly true of the Yudhoyono era, the 10 years of SBY's rule, which altered our expectations of the relationship at the government to government level. After the low point reached in a relationship following the independence vote in Timor-Leste, uh, matters began to improve and gradually increased until it could be said that Yuri Yono's presidency greatly raised expectations of how the relationship would be managed between Australia and Indonesia. There are four key factors in this. The first was his personal warmth and enthusiasm for Australia, which would be interesting to explore the reasons for, but let's just take it as a given. Secondly, his foreign policy emphasis on Indonesia's international standing, the thousands of friends and zero enemies approach, um, and his very strong concern for his country to be seen as a liberal democracy, as a model for uh, an Islamic transition to democracy, and as a good international citizen, and for him in particular to be seen as a key figure in delivering that in international eyes. Uh, Third, his relatively secure position politically. He usually had the numbers when he needed them in the DPR and was able also to rein in some uh, aggressive critics of Australia in elite circles when he chose to. And fourth, I think credit has to be given to some very strategic Australian moves. The grant of the, the massive, uh, now controversial, retrospectively controversial aid after the tsunami, for example. Um, incidentally, about half of that was loans, which was paid off, just for the record. Uh, the Order of Australia for SBY, his address to a joint sitting, etc. And I think also the great, uh, the, the significance of Australia's aid and its huge scholarship program in Indonesia 
for the bilateral relationship is often overlooked. But this meant that the standard Department of Foreign Affairs account of relations under SBY's rule was that it was as good as it gets. Indonesia was Australia's best friend in the region. This led to a high level of confidence and hugely increased interactions at all levels, government and non-government, across a wide range of organisations and agencies in a way that had not been seen under previous presidents. And this was true despite the inevitable tensions that did take place. Indonesian ambassadors withdrawn twice during his term uh, in, over the Papuan asylum seeker crisis, over the Snowden wiretap leaks, which was the worst moment under SBY's rule. But all these tensions, and they became very severe in the case of the wiretaps, could, however, and were ultimately managed in a fairly predictable fashion. And when they took place, government felt that it could and would be sorted out. And there was right from the earliest stage in both those crises a sense of where it would go and how it would be sorted. For example, the removal of the suspension of military intelligence and people smuggling cooperation was always considered inevitable before Yudhoyono left office, and so it proved to be with the signing of the roadmap last year. Equally uh, clear that the current framework for extradition uh, and so forth is not working. We need new extradition treaties. We need to go through the extraordinarily difficult process of negotiating a prisoner exchange agreement. We want working protocols on paroles. We need to cooperate closely on prison reform. These sort of matters that will go directly towards the issue of the criminal justice system in Indonesia malfunctioning can protect citizens of both countries in the future and would build on the reforms that actually started under Yuri Yono administration and which were actually taken by the Melbourne Mafia member, Denny Indriana, um, which is one of the reasons why he now finds himself targeted, I believe. It would build on reforms that already started in Indonesia. It would be protect citizens of Indonesia and Australia. And we can be absolutely certain that there will be citizens of Australia in that system in the future, just as there will be more Indonesians in the Australian system. It would remain to be seen, however, whether the Jokowi government has any interest in either of the initiatives I'm arguing for, a multilateral approach on the death penalty and reform to Indonesian and Australian criminal cooperation system. It probably doesn't at the moment. I expect the Minister for Law and Human Rights, however, might, and that would be a good starting point. Thank you. You, all, you, you can all now appreciate that given that background and my, and my particular research interest, I'm absolutely totally uns, unsuitable to, uh, to pass comment on, on the, on the Jokowi uh, uh, presidency. We've heard four great presentations from looking at the Jokowi's presidency from different angles and Tim uh, finishing up looking at the, at the, at the by at the bilateral relationship. I think this is you know, six, half a year into uh, Jokowi's presidency. I think it, it's, a, it's a confronting and, and somewhat sobering uh, occasion in the sense that I could not have imagined in the couple of months running up to uh, the, the, the elections in, in July that we would be having this type of discussion about Jokowi's presidency. And I, I think it's not, not simply a matter that, that both uh, Australian-based observers of Indonesian politics and I think many Indonesian analysts and commentators themselves, uh, I think very few of them, even the staunch supporters of Prabowo, could have imagined midway through last year that we would be listening to the types of presentations that we've, um, uh, we've, we've, we've heard tonight. So I, I think we've got to, we've got to you know, re reflect on, on our own analysis and how we, we, in a sense, many of us got, got whipped up in the enthusiasm, the euphoria that, 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 that accompanied uh, Jokowi's rise as a, as a presidential candidate and finally successfully elected. I think it also tells us something about the nature of the democratization process that we're, uh, we're, we're observing in Indonesia. I think what, what Nadia uh, explained very, very, in a very convincing manner, Jokowi is a, 
as a provincial politician and a provincial politician of, of really fairly limited uh, experience even as, as a mayor of Solo, a furniture salesman before, a uh, furniture manufacturer uh, before 2005, generated enormous public appeal, successfully mobilised uh, very broad based support within civil society in an election in an electoral system that enabled somebody from outside of the political elite to get elected. That's only the first part of the battle, if you like. In, in, the, the, the second bit is that that, the, that electoral system and the political structures that a president has to work within has made it, as all four uh, of, the, of, our, of our speakers clearly, clearly analysed, makes it extraordinarily difficult for an outsider and a very inexperienced president to actually govern. So that there, there, I think mu much of it yeah, much of our analysis has to focus on the particular background, personalities, skills of President Jokowi himself, but I think we need also to, 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 to look at the, the systemic dimension of it and how direct elections for president enable people like Jokowi to get elected, but it makes it very, very difficult for them then to actually function as a... As a uh, as, as an effective president. I really like Gemma's diagram and, 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 the, <laughs> and, and, and the, the way that that helped us uh, understand the points that, that, that Dave and Nadia were, were also making. That the diagram helped us to, to, to understand that Jokowi's governance problems, if your governance challenges, are not only with the the pair, the parliament, and a, uh, and, and, and a majority notionally, notionally dominated by the, uh, by, by the uh, Meriputi coalition notionally supporting his, uh, uh, his opponent, but in, in, in a way more importantly uh, with his own coalition partners, and particularly PDIP and particularly Megawati, many of the, the compromises that he, that he had to make in terms of selecting a cabinet reflected those difficulties. He, he, I think it was Nadia who's, who said he's probably the weakest president that we've uh, ever, ever seen in Indonesia. And much of that, I think, goes to, goes to the fact that he doesn't really have a party. You know, before... B before PDIP nominated him for mayor of Solo in 2005, he wasn't a party activist. He, in a sense, was plucked out of not quite nowhere. You know, he was clearly an important business figure uh, in Solo, but somebody of no experience. So un un unlike all the uh, presidents, you know, the obvious example of, of, um, uh, of, of, of SBY, SBY created his own party in order to get elected as president. Jokowi's basis of support uh, is so weak because, in a sense, he doesn't have his own party. Uh, and his particular, and, and in, in a way, if we look back at the dynamics of why he was nominated by PDIP, and the PDIP-led uh, led coalition, because Mega was, Megawati Sakano Putri was finally convinced that she couldn't win uh, if she nominated herself. So it, from the very beginning, a, a very uneasy relationship didn't matter so much in small political arena like Solo, uh, but on a national scale, I think it is absolutely, um, uh, ab absolutely critical. But in a way, what we're... What we're seeing with President Jokowi is a president learning on the job. You know, much, in much the same way, if we look at what he did in, in Solo, he also learned on the job. If you look at the, the, what he campaigned about in 2005 
were not the programs, not the style of leadership which he became famous for in, in, um, uh, in, in, the, in the subsequent, um, uh, sub subsequent years. Gemma posed the question of why his popularity seems to, to remain reasonably, reasonably solid for the, 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 the first three months and then has uh, declined much more rapidly in the, in the second three months. And I think Dave McRae's analysis provides much of the, of the reasons for that remarkable decline. And, clear, and clearly the, uh, his ability to recover uh, will depend on, the, on, on his capacity to, to, um, uh, to, to deal with the issues of the, of the police, the cap by car, and the broader issue of, um, uh, broader issue of corruption. Tim's analysis of the, of the, of the bilateral relationship was, was critical. I, I, I can remember writing a paper, and I think about 2000, 2001, so at the beginning, you know, the, the, fir the first period of, of democratization in, in Indonesia, and I guess in, in, the, in, in, in the light of the, the crisis over Timor in, in 1999. In that paper, I argued that with democratic a democratic polities at both ends of the bilateral relationship is going to become much more volatile. But I anticipated that the volatility would most, mostly be generated from the Indonesian end. I was quite wrong. I think as Tim, as Tim has argued very, uh, very convincingly, much of the volatility has come from the Australian end. And I, I, I and we can, we can think of the, 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 well, clearly the, the Bali Nine, Chappelle Corby, uh, refugee boats, it, those issues which generate broad popular interest in Australia are particularly difficult for our politicians to manage. And I think Tim's point about there are always going to be issues of difference within the bilateral relationship, partly for for reasons that we're, we're, we're neighbours, and it really hinges on the ability of politicians at both ends of that, uh, of that relationship and on how, how it's managed and, and the, the, the security importance of it managed and continued and, and while, while there, there are in, inevitably, in, in, inevitably issues that are going to disrupt it. I think it all, all also necessitates that particularly for our politicians the ability to realise that what they say is heard and understood just as quickly in Jakarta as it is in the western suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne. So the issues that, that resonate and that are, uh, are beneficial for domestic support often have the very reverse effect to audiences in Indonesia.